Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of the New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with scholar David Correa to discuss the relationship between law, violence, and property, and how it played itself out in land-grant issues in New Mexico, resulting in the most, most famously in the courthouse raid at Tierra Maria in 1967. Dr. Correa is a professor uh, in the American Studies program, is the managing editor of La Jicarita, a online environmental magazine from northern New Mexico, and the author of a stunning new book called Properties of Violence, Law, and Land Grant Struggles in Northern New Mexico. Welcome to the library at the New Mexico Mercury. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. In your book, you put the land grant struggle in, in the 20th century and the 19th century in the context uh, of the full perspective of law and, and violence and property. When you begin your narrative about land wars with the Utes and the Apaches, could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I wanted the, the book starts with uh, violent Indian removal as, as, as really the, the conditions whereby Spanish and Mexican land grants were possible. And this, this to me, is um, the, the secret unknown story about land grants in New Mexico. You know, I, I think that um, often uh, land grant politics in New Mexico, particularly after Tirina in the 60s, um, was a politics of, well, we're, we're, all, we're, all, we're both native and Hispanic. And that resolves any of that violent history because we have that we have the conqueror's blood and the conquered blood coursing through our bodies, and and so to me that's true, but a, a, a real simplification of what really went on. So, um, and, and it also to me is the the real the real problem I think with contemporary land grant politics in New Mexico because what it means is that people have not really bothered to reconcile this very violent history. And it makes it really easy, I think, for people who are critics of land grant activists to say, well, we don't have any sympathy for your position because you were conquerors first and then you were conquered. And so, you know, you got you got what was coming to you. So um, I, I was, the point of the book wasn't to say, see, look, those critics are right. They were conquerors first and then they were conquered, but rather to try to figure out, you know, who, who benefited from those violent colonial relationships among settlers and Utes and Apaches, um, you know, who put in motion, or who gave momentum to this, these violent patterns of colonialism that no doubt um, completely dispossessed Utes and Apaches of any claim to northern New Mexico. And so in the book, when I do that, what I do is I show that, you know, the people who actually moved from Abiquiu up to TA in the 19th century weren't the elites of colonial society in Santa Fe, but rather were just cannon fodder in a violent war between powerful economic interests in Spain and also Mexico, and more powerful Ute and Apache and Comanche and Navajo tribes, much more powerful. What we find when you look at this history is that Spain and Mexico after it uh, had, had a really tenuous grasp on New Mexico. And in order to keep those settlements alive, they had to buffer the violence that they experienced from Utes and Apaches and Comanches with this human shield of poor people. And, yeah. and that was what, what the, the, those were the people that were moving to tiny little villages like Pitaca and Vaisitos and Abiquiu and, and even north of Abiquiu to TA. Um, people who were, were landless, um, poor, they're either living in barrios in Santa Fe or landless sheep herders in Abiquiu, desperate for land and really having no other choice, right? So if, if those are the people who have that claim to Spanish land or Mexican land, that's a different kind of colonial story, yes, I think. Yes. And, and we don't really figure that out um, until we really sort of examine that history. Now, there's no doubt that the very people who are moving north, these sort of poor landless settlers, were a part of the militias that were fighting Utes to remove them. Right? But the, the sort of the, re, the real sort of complicated, messy colonial reality on the ground is something that I don't think is a story that's usually a part of New Mexico's land grant history. So after the expulsion of native populations, um, in the 19th and 20th centuries, we find um, really the land grant struggle was primarily about the preservation of the commons over the usurpation of 
a private property, is that right? I think I think that's right, but with a caveat that almost makes it wrong. Okay, good, oh, good, good, good. <laughs> but, okay. So, it, it, I, and this is the way that land grant stories, uh, land grant histories in New Mexico are usually told. That it's this collision between this private property culture of uh, of Anglo settlers arriving after in the mid eighteen hundreds. Um, uh, and the existing common property relations of Spanish and Mexican settlers and Spanish and Mexican land grants. And that's a, a that is like, um, that's the gospel truth, according to land grant history. And it's completely wrong because first Spain and Mexico, uh, were quite clear around, um, their questions of property relations. It wasn't just common property in these land grants. Um, all of the land grants in northern New Mexico, whether they're community land grants or, or large private uh, land grants, mixed common property, what we, would, what we would recognize as common property with private property. Right. There was no other way to settle these, sort of, these, these uh, arid, um, remote land grants, dangerous because of, of how far they were pushed into Indian borderlands. And so it had to have this mix to attract people that were willing to go there. They were willing to, to really give their lives up for, to have a small plot of private land and then share an access to a large commons where they could graze animals and cut firewood and hunt, right, and collect wildings. That was the point of the land grant. And so it, it wasn't the collision, I think, in the, in the, that we usually understand. Um, what really happens is the 19th and 20th century in New Mexico become this dramatic sort of legal struggle between Anglo settlers and Anglo politicians and speculators trying to acquire vast acreages and trying to figure out how to make money off of that. Yes. And these communities trying to defend these, these, rela these property relations, these particular kinds of property relations. And so it, it, it doesn't just happen like at a collision, like two ships colliding in the night, but rather is this long drawn out struggle that, that lasts, in, in, in my book at least, it lasts until about 1990. That's, there's no difference wow. in that struggle but in 1990 than it was in 1890. It's the same legal struggle of trying to define what a legitimate property claim is in a land grant um, and how to define that in the courts and how it gets enforced on the ground and how it's resisted by people who live in these land grants. So what we see um, of the land grant struggle in New Mexico now, what most of us see, is um, huge chunks of national forest all over the north. Um, but uh, no one really understands how the national government acquired all that land and who they acquired it from. And indeed, uh, uh, national forests are part of the legacy of that early struggle. Uh, could you sort of clear that up a little bit for us? Yeah, one one um, one real irony of the of the decades of speculation in which um, you know money poured into New Mexico and in, in really the eight, beginning in like the eighteen late eighteen seventies railroads arrive and money follows the railroads. Uh, prior to that, there was no way to unlock the economic potential of uh, grazing or timber or mining in northern New Mexico. But those railroads arrive and all of a sudden it's possible. Or or, or speculators think. Wow, this is amazing. Um, and they're convincing investors from Amsterdam and London and all over Germany, all over the world, mostly, you know, Chicago financiers and, and East Coast capitalists are investing millions and millions of dollars in New Mexico. And they're all going bankrupt. Ah. <laughs> they're absolutely all going bankrupt. Right? And, and if you look at a map today of the Santa Fe National Forest and the Carson National Forest, both of them are, are over a million acres each. Almost every single acre used to be a Spanish or Mexican land grant. Wow. That was, that was either rejected by courts in the 18, late 1800s or acquired by speculators who couldn't make a go of it and sold it to the United States for a song. Uh -huh. And so the forest reserves, which begin in the early 20th century, begin with these large purchases of former land grant land. And they're always purchases from speculators who had acquired it, often through dubious means, then they can't make a profit from it. They're, not, they're unable to trans, translate this land grant into what they want it to be, which is a commodity that's going to make them millions of dollars. It doesn't. And they become uh, part of the forest reserves, which later becomes the Carson. 
and Santa Fe National Forest. And those purchases continue throughout the early 20th century. Oh, and okay. uh, actually, we, we wrote a piece in La Jacarita about documenting the Carson and Santa Fe National Forest and which land grants and when they were purchased oh, and, wow. and where they are and how they, they make up the, the Carson and National Forest. And so it, it really is, I think, um, easy to understand when we consider that history why much of the conflict, particularly in the 90s, a lot of the environmental conflict in New Mexico in the 90s was between a lot of environmentalists who see the national forest as this national um, object. And to folks in northern New Mexico, it's seen as something much different, right? It's this is the common, the former commons of the land grant. And often, as I show in the book, those commons are still real, actual, everyday commons to people, regardless of what the state says, regardless of what courts say. They're using it as a commons and, and do so, at least in Tierra Maria, up until the 1970s, continuing to move cattle and sheep up to the highlands, continuing to, uh, to cut timber, just like they had always done, completely ignoring any of these court cases, completely ignoring these claims of private property, in some cases not even realizing yeah. that anyone else has these, these claims. I guess in the, uh, the mid-1960s, Reyes Lopez Tierra appears on the scene. Uh, from Texas and Arizona and other places. Uh, he finds in northern New Mexico, after his studies in New Mexico City and other things, he finds a, uh, an enormously rich, long history of land-grant struggles, uh, sort of ready to be catalyzed or, uh, or not ready, I don't know. Uh, but he, he certainly didn't invent what was going on up there. I suspect that his legacy is really the, the way in which he made the land grant movement in New Mexico also an urban movement. Um, and at the time it was a movement of, of land grants themselves. There, wasn't these, there weren't these alliances often. They were more informal. Uh, Tierra Maria land grant heirs in the 30s were organizing and they were talking to other land grants and trying to figure out strategies to uh, reacquire the common lands, um, but what he did, you're right, is he, I think he catalyzed a movement that was, that was uh, in, in, in which dozens of land grants had for years and for generations been working on, and he brought that together into this mass, mass movement. But in, in, in Tierra, Tierra Maria, you know, he, he's a, he was a much different figure, you know. There, there was this infrastructure of social activism, and these, and it was generations deep of people who had been working on this struggle, and he benefited from their expertise, their knowledge. They educated him on the land grant history. Uh, his first teachers were people like Jose Martinez, uh, I mean, Juan Martinez, Fernanda Martinez, Jose Maria Martinez, heirs of the Tierra Mia land grant, who taught him about what this history meant. And, and then he, you know, and then he, he goes to Mexico City and he start he, he, he locates the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which people had never heard about right. at that time, right? right. And, and no one could find a copy of it, <laughs> right? And even at the time, Myra Jenkins, the state historian in Mexico, uh, denied the, ex the legitimate existence of Spanish and Mexican land grants. To her, it was a myth. And, and he was a con man. And so I think his, his legacy and I think the way in which he was able to electrify people was because... I mean, he stood directly up to power uh, and he told an entirely different story and it very quickly became clear he was right, yeah. right? That his version of the story, which he, again, you know, he, he didn't invent this whole out of cloth. I mean, he, he had been educated by land grant activists and then he took it this step further. Um, and so, yeah, I think that his, his uh, he played an incredibly important um, part in the story, but what I wanted to do in the book was to, you know, to, to suggest that as fascinating as he is as an historical figure, as important as he is in New Mexico, and as remarkable as the 1967 courthouse raid is, um, it's not even close to the most interesting and fascinating part of the story of the Tierra Maria Land Grant. So when I was 26, I was the uh, Tribune's uh, Tierra man, um, and, and I had a wonderful opportunity to uh, to meet him many times and talk with him and and, um, and I realized that, that that the stories I were getting I was getting in in 
in California, in East LA, let's say, were very, very different from uh, the stories I was getting up north in Albuquerque, too. He was indeed a culture hero in Albuquerque. Then in Los Angeles, certain places in Texas, and he really wasn't all that well liked up north. I mean, there was at least a schism around his his character. Um, but the, the as as I was reading your book and trying to trying to understand the the uh, what you make really obvious is the relationship between property and violence and law. Uh, I got to thinking about the raid itself. And how that thing really does embody that whole, that whole almost storm cloud of of law and and real nasty violence on everybody's part, uh, and particularly after the raid, uh, where I can remember real briefly, I walked in the newsroom of the Tribune, and there were the, there was a foreign wire and a domestic wire, and I looked at the pictures, and uh, the domestic wire had tanks. And the foreign wire had tanks, and one was the Six Day War, and the other one was uh, Ely Francis and and Dave Cargo, you know, leading the charge up into the up north with the National Guard troops and stuff. So, what is the uh, what what was so symbolic about that raid? You know, the the raid has symbolizes a lot of different things for for different people. I think for for Tirina, you know. Uh, the weekend before the raid, he was unknown even in New Mexico outside of land grant circles. And by the Tuesday after the raid, he was a national figure. Um, and and it really catapulted both both him and the Alianza, the organization that he co-founded with his brother, into this national consciousness. And and he he parlayed that notoriety to to really move the land grant movement into this, the mainstream civil rights movement. Um, and, and he was, you know, as everyone has ever said, I mean, he was a remarkably charismatic speaker. And, and so for people in like East LA or people, um, and, and particularly Black Panthers, who, who really admired Tiarina quite a bit, he was important because to him, to them, the courthouse raid was the, 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 the moment that this, this civil rights struggle became a revolutionary movement. They took up arms against the state. Now, if we actually think about what happened in northern New Mexico, this was um, much different. This wasn't this wasn't this uh, predetermined effort to take up arms against the state, but rather just one in a series of provocative tactics in which T. Arena used to, you know, go and try to you know do citizens' arrests on prominent people, and he just wanted to drive to that courthouse. And put the de- district attorney Alfonso Sanchez under under um, c- citizens arrest, and instead it turns into this gun battle that um, that he didn't plan and couldn't have predicted. Um, and so, in the uh, the chapter in which I write about this, what I'm tr- I, I'm trying to write about this differently. Instead, I want to dis- decenter um, both Tirina, but also the idea that violence is always, um, you know something that land-grant activists do, right? That they're violent, that their movement is violent, and they've been violent. And so this chapter focuses on the violence of the state directed at Tirina and at Alianza. He was a target of the FBI, the New Mexico State Police, who spent years surveilling him, other members of Alianza. Um, they, they thought he was a foreign agent, a subversive figure. He eventually gets elevated onto the rabble-rouser index, right. this absolutely ridiculous index that J. Edgar Hoover himself creates, uh, that the most, you know, we're talking about Malcolm X, <laughs> Reyes Lopez Tirina, and just a few other Americans were on this list. And it, the list really opened up the full measure of state violence and it directed directed at Tirina. And so the years before, and particularly the years immediately after, and well into the 70s and 80s, land-grant activists in northern New Mexico became targets of uh, coercive agents of the state, police, FBI agents, um, and, and others. That is a story that's usually ignored or is an unknown completely when we think about um, you know, that, those, those years of, of struggle in northern New Mexico. I guess this is where the, the intersection of property and legal violence uh, sort of comes to, into play. I, I can remember uh, trying to write a biography of Tyrion, uh, a very short one, 
uh, for the newspaper, and I went to the FBI because he used to be a police reporter, and I asked them if they had any inf information, and you know they brought out nine boxes of stuff, which is you know I don't think that was probably even legal at the time, but um, but I just got this little sort of flavor of what of how suddenly land, and I didn't really understand this until you wrote about it, how land became uh, synonymous with race, and how race becomes synonymous with revolution and subversion, and how civil rights is somehow, and land rights are somehow turned into this uh, corrupting uh, fiction, uh, um, and, and uh, legitimizing all kinds of terrible uh, police state uh, activities, which I think now you know they've kind of evolved into enormous, sophisticated satellite right. <laughs> or surveillance. Prism. Under, uh, yes, in, indeed. So, can we talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. And also, could you touch a little bit on the on the strange vigilante violence that happened around Albuquerque after the TA raid, where cars were blown up and houses right. were thing and, and uh, the Alianza headquarters were, were bombed and other things. Yeah, you know, one of, one of the arguments I'm making in this book, um, I, I, I try to help figure out a way to understand the, the violence of land-grant struggle, not just historical violence, but violence, you know, more recent, uh, in the 90s, even in TA, was a sort of armed standoff, um, which is part of the last chapter. And I, I think we have to go back to thinking about law and property and its relation to violence. So private property can't exist as private property without enforcement. Mm -hmm. And enforcement doesn't just imply violence, it requires it. It requires violence in order for it to exist as private property. And we usually think of the, the enforcement of private property or really the enforcement of any laws by the state as the legitimate action of a sovereign authority. But the state has this monopoly on violence. And it's not violence, because it's, it's the way this social order is held together. Um, but when we actually look at the way that enforcement is carried out, we see something much different. And so what I was trying to do in the book is, is demonstrate how private property gets constructed by the courts, gets invented whole cloth by the courts, in, the, in a series of court cases from the 30s to the 60s, where the courts sort of uh, telescope into the past, this idea that private property has always been there, and we're just now discovering it, and we're declaring it as is existing on these land grants. And then the next chapter is, and now enforcement happens. Ah! And, and so that, those legal decisions have no real effect on everyday life until the police start enforcing it. Oh, and what happens is about a 15 year struggle between land grant members, and, this is, and I'm really restricting my comments to the TR Maria land grant because they were the ones that were going to court to try to win back, legally win back the right to the land grant. And in a time and time again, the courts were rejecting it and saying, not only we reject your claims, but we find that it has always been private property. And then the state steps in. And so the years immediately after the final court case that establishes this, this you know, this, um, the case law that creates what we know of today as the private property in Tierra Maria um, is a series of violent uh, crackdowns by police, uh, both against not just Tierra but against Alianza, against members of, of, of Alianza, and against TA land grant heirs. And they include, um, and you're referring to a few of the bombings in Albuquerque, um, Santiago Anaya was a member of Alianza, had his car blown up by a, by a hand, hand grenade under his car. Um, all along, there was a, 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 a garage, was, uh, one member was blown up in Albuquerque. A ranch up north that some people offered to Alianza for training gets blown up. And all along, Alianza and Tirina are saying, the police are doing this, we know it, and no one believes them until this, um, this, this former U.S. Marshal blows his hand up, putting a bomb at the headquarters of Allianz in downtown Albuquerque, right? And, and even the FBI, right? The, uh, even J. Edgar Hoover is writing memos back and forth to special, special agents in charge in Albuquerque saying, we want to stay out of this because this violence against land grant heirs began as soon as the New Mexico State Police seized the membership files of Alianza. Oh. And once that happens, all of a sudden, this pattern of violence starts playing out. So 
what I'm trying to do in the book is two things. First, like theoretically suggests, property it re relies on violence for it to be property. And that violence is not the legitimate violence of a sovereign authority, but often is just the baton of a police officer smacking itself on the head of a land grant heir who's trying to make a legitimate claim outside of a courtroom. And that's literally what's happening in TA and what I'm trying to, trying to write about in the book. So when uh, the state police managed to get a hold of the list of Alianza members, this sort of leads me now to think about prison, indeed, about this kind of incredible... Mm -hmm knowledge of what's, you know, what everybody's doing and who everybody is. And, and now, you know, as I recall reading, up, and this was a f the file cabinet or something, or a little box with, you know, with names, uh, a quite a different world. Um, but still the same, the same thing holds. Information now becomes property, and it becomes uh, protected by the rule of law and by and by the force of law, and if you trespass into that information, you become a traitor and an object of derision and all kinds of other things. So the uh, the essence of your of your thesis, which is really an eye opener to me, is that is that this is indeed uh, the hidden um, the hidden reality. You know, there's there's one key difference between the kind of surveillance, for example, that the FBI and the New Mexico State Police were doing in the 1960s and 70s, and what, for example, the NSA is doing today with PRISM. The difference was the data set. <laughs> in the 60s and the 70s, it was difficult to get that data set they wanted. They wanted, you know, as much information about people as they could get. And so when you look through these FBI files in the, from the 60s and the 70s, they were mostly reading newspapers. They were reading yeah. your columns, yeah. actually. Maybe. I, I, as a matter of fact, I've gone through Tiarita's FBI file and Pedro Atroleta's FBI file and others FBI that I requested. And there's newspaper articles from like Peter Nabokov yeah. and you and others. And, but they were also recording speeches and interviewing people. And, and they were also recruiting infiltrators and agents provocateurs. Um, so it was different than what's happening today. But there was one thing that was this, that's the same. The, the, the thing that's the same today with PRISM was the same then, which was no matter how much information you have in these surveillance programs, the problem is always sorting that information. How do we sort that information? And it always starts with a profile. What's the threat? And what, who, do, who is that threat? And how do we define that threat? And once we do that, then we look into our data set, into our information, and we find those people that meet those parameters, oh. right? That social sorting is what happens. So yeah. in the in the sort of the J. Edgar Hoover FBI of the 1960s, race became a proxy for subversion. Yeah. And so what they were looking for were racial agitators, as, oh. as J. Edgar Hoover called them. And for him, anyone who uh, was a member of a civil rights movement first was suspect. And if they were a black man or a black woman or they were Hispanic or they spoke a different language, that marked them as subversive. But it particularly was race. And he was very clear, J. Edgar Hoover was, in memos back and forth to Albuquerque SAC, uh, special agents in charge, which was that that th we're in the middle of a race war and we're not going to be caught flat-footed. right? So, And this gives way in the 70s, after Tiarina, in the 70s, in which race then doesn't become a marker of subversion. It becomes a marker of domestic terrorism that then becomes yeah. the threat. And, and so uh, the last chapter of the book, I'm really showing how, you know, the Chicano movement in the Southwest, the FBI links them to the Puerto Rican separatist movement right. in New York, right? So the FAA. bombings going on by FALN in New York and Chicago become linked to land grant activists of all things yeah. in New Mexico. And, and, and this is really as one of the footnotes, I don't know, I sort of buried this footnote because um, as late as 2005, the, the domestic terrorism unit of the FBI was still, you know, had returned to this question of, is Tierra Maria still this hotbed of Chicano militancy? Wow. And, and so this is really how um, land grant activists become a target and, and Tierra becomes a target. Because in this sort of strange bureaucratic world of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, race is always the most important way to sort through um, all the information they have on potential threats to, to the U.S. Um, as 
and find that subversive element that they have to eliminate. And eliminate, they would do it, right? I mean, in, 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 in San Diego, um, in the church committee hearings after COINTELPRO became public knowledge and outraged so many people, um, and Frank Church, an Idaho Democrat, has a series of Senate hearings, you know, they were reading memos in which the FBI is taking credit for violence in the ghetto um, through a various variety of tactics, because to them, these are racial agitators and therefore a threat to the U.S. and therefore a legitimate target for violence. So in uh, this struggle in Tierra Maria, we see the sort of, um, when we look at it from hindsight, we see the seeds of a, of a greatly expanded, almost hysterical uh, association and projection of, of race and civil rights and other things, um, even to the degree of associating New Mexicans with Puerto Ricanos and in, in, in an independence movement. Um, what do you think, um, in the long run, uh, is there... Is there ever a way to sort of popularly deconstruct this connection so more people understand that, uh, that this is um, not only wrong, but irrational, uh, almost mad? Um, how does one go about doing that aside from writing books? And, uh, is there a way to do it? You know, one of, the, one of the things I, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book and take up the question of, Land grant history and contemporary land grant struggles because the book come you know as I told my publisher the book starts in 1776 and finishes last Wednesday you know the, so the <laughs> epilogue tries to, tries to bring it into the present and 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 mark out what's at stake today and one of the reasons why to me this is important is because um, you know we're living today in a state um, undergoing dramatic climate change. Um, much of that, much of the land in northern New Mexico managed by a bureaucracy incapable of caring for that land. Yeah. The Forest Service has been hollowed out by budget cuts and, and, you know, and can't do the job that it's supposed to, that it, t it tells us it will do. And I suspect and have suspected for a long time that, that, that this sort of, this arrangement uh, of federal lands ownership in northern New Mexico isn't going to last very long. Ah. Um, it certainly won't last forever, as nothing does. And so, what's next? And yeah. I think that I think that one of the really frightening things for a lot of people, particularly in the '60s and '70s, was the fact that Tiarina and Allianz and other land grant wanted the land back, yeah. and that meant that it would be closed off to anybody else. Right, I think that if you're if you're someone who cares about hiking or hunting or fishing or what camping or whatever, you think, oh my gosh, this these lands are gonna you know be behind these fences and I'll never have access to them. Um, and land grant activists have always said, no, that's not that was that was never the way that land grants were organized. That's never the intent. And so there's something else lurking in these the way in which land grants are always seen as the illegitimate potential. Uh, care, you know, caretakers for land, and it has to do with race. And right? I think that that um, the the Forest Service, particularly in the '30s and '40s, uh, uh, developed and constantly reinforced this paternalist relationship to land grant communities in northern New Mexico, and defined them as people as uh, um, incapable of caring for the land, incapable of of understanding the ecological relations going on around them, um, and and depicting them as anti-ecological actors, and often just in the same way that Hoover defined race as subversion, the Forest Service defined race as that which defines someone's inability to care for the land appropriately. It was this racist ecological argument, which I think is also at the root of a lot of environmental claims um, to, to northern New Mexico. And, uh, you know, this was what was happening in the 90s. These people are, are unable to care for the land. And therefore, we need scientific resource managers to make these decisions for them. And so one of the things that I wanted to do in this book was to demonstrate where that rhetoric comes from, um, where the logic of that racist logic comes from and what it really does and who it serves. Because it certainly doesn't serve any of us in New Mexico. I think it serves a sort of 
uh, elite. And, and in the 70s and 80s in northern Mexico, it served a corporate elite who, was, who were able to really sort of capture resources and communities and, and, and you know, clear-cut whole forests, Duke City Lumber, for example, in northern New Mexico. So what I'm trying to do in the book is really figure out, like, you know, what have we really lost with these kinds of histories? Um, what, what has been foreclosed by the sort of, by the history of violence by the state? What has been foreclosed by the, the Forest Service mismanagement? And what is maybe possible now if we can think beyond that? And that's, so that's, and that's an impossible thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I have no idea how to do it. Uh, I only know how to write this book yeah. and hope that it's a uh, part, you know, um, part of, of, of a way to think much differently about our relationship to the land, our relationship to each other, and our also our relationship to history, which um, I don't think that um, certainly the way that history is told in New Mexico is often this sort of heroic narrative that makes it impossible to think about history from just is this the average person who you know who usually gets erased from those history books so to me this is a history book told from the bottom up rather than from the top down well david thank you so very very much and i really do um, hope that everybody reads properties of violence it's a, it's a mind expanding experience and i'm really so happy you've been here with us today yeah, thank you for inviting me. This is this has been great. I, I, I love to talk about this stuff, as you can tell. Um, and and um, and I'm really glad that that you like the book so much. That's great.